Hello, lovelies. Welcome to Friday. And uh, I've just been for a nice long walk around the village. Completed a couple of side quests. Helping a woman find an obscure cottage to deliver dry cleaning to. So I've earned my experience for the day. What have you been doing? Um, yeah, so I need content. <laughs> and, uh, I need easy content. So uh, answering comments and giving people updates seems like a, a good way to do that and a and a good habit to get into like like the walking so uh let's see buy my stuff um there should for some of you at least be like a scroll bar of uh merch from teespring beneath the video uh, so they've allowed me to link that but so far they haven't allowed me to connect you to my shopify shop which is annoying so uh, to post dashmort.com if you want to buy actual role-playing material and if you're more into lifestyle brands the merch might be below but there is a link to it from post-mort.com anyway so uh yeah the, i've been doing this role for insight for a, for a while now and um with a couple of contributors uh which has been interesting it's definitely something i want to do more of it gets consistent views but not fantastic views but i'm out of questions for myself so if you want to drop a few questions um in the comments here that would be incredibly helpful um or say so yeah it could be questions about the business or kind of tangentially about the business of role-playing games game design uh, problems that you're having in your campaign at home that i might be able to help you out with um, anything feel feel free to draw on my uh, far too much experience uh, in the industry and at, as a gamer for anything or anything you're just just curious about I'll even answer stupid questions and if you want to participate and you work in or around the RPG industry and don't mind being asked questions I've been giving participants about 10 questions so far um, then let me know. You'll just need to be able to record a video or, or audio if you don't want to appear on camera answering a few questions. And that's all that's going to need. It's not a huge amount of work and it does expose you potentially uh, to my audience, which is okay for our obscure little corner of the internet where we talk about role-playing game stuff. Uh, health. I am bumping along okay. Just had one of my last baby teeth out. Uh, you may have noticed a lot of coughing <laughs> on recent videos. Uh, that is a side effect of some of the medication I'm on to stop my heart pumping too hard and killing me. But uh, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, side effect of that. But I have a drink with me. So hopefully I won't be coughing too much through this video. And unfortunately running table topless gives me plenty of uh, breaks <laughs> for my voice and uh, I always have a stack of drink to get me through that because there's a lot of talking involved. Right, I've also decided that I think I'm going to start answering at least some people's comments <laughs> um, in videos uh, rather than in comment threads because quite often stuff just gets lost in the comments and so you know, maybe you don't get a reply, maybe you leave a comment, but YouTube randomly just decides to delete it, or many, any of the many other shenanigans uh, that can go on there on YouTube. I do not normally delete comments, um, and I always check my held for review thing, usually about once a day, to see if any comments have been slung in there, but I have no control over what YouTube does with people's comments. So you may, what, may well find that your comment has been removed. God knows what reason. Uh, the algorithms are capricious, so who knows why. But the only reason I have to delete a comment is if it's completely irrelevant to the topic at hand, either from the video or the comment thread in question, if it's spam or, yeah, if it just contains a string of expletives and nonsense with, with no value whatsoever, you know, even for my amusement in replying, um, then that might get deleted. But otherwise, I don't delete comments. So it's not me, it's YouTube, or it's you. All right, let's have a look at the comments, shall we? So uh, many years ago now, I made a couple of videos 
debunking the idea of the Kalergi plan, which supposedly is this sinister plot laid out by uh, Count Kudenhof Kalergi, who was a half German, half Japanese man uh, prior to World War II, who had a vision of a united Europe. He didn't really lay out a plan for it, but he observed that this was likely to be something that would happen. Obviously, as a mixed racial guy, um, you know, he thought that was a good thing. I do too. Uh, <laughs> but there's no actual plan. There is no Kalergi plan. The book they point to is Practical Idealism or Practical Idealismus. And it's written in a slightly archaic form of German. It's a bit hard to read. Um, if you know any German, I know a little bit, not enough to read it. There are translations, but unfortunately, most translations have been made by far-right conspiracy theorists who attach prefaces, and their translations basically can't be trusted. But there are other translations out there. If you read it, it is a relatively wealthy mixed-race man talking about how he thinks the future is going to go. At a time when air travel was bringing people together, the telegraph and the radio was bringing people together, and he saw the tides of civilization turning in a way that would be more internationalist and more globalist, and he suggested that this is what was going to happen and that it would probably be a good thing, and, and this is what seems to have triggered all the racists, uh, that the Jews were in a uniquely good position to do well out of this or to help guide it, I suppose, or, or manage it because they were a very truly international people having been thrown out of all sorts of places and having been victims of all sorts of problems. So, yeah, it's a lot of preamble to answer a few stupid comments, but that's the context. Anyway, there is no plan in the book. So my debunk of the Kalergi plan is that there is no plan in the book where far-right conspiracy theorists say there's a plan. So, uh, let's have a look. Uh, Scrabby McScrotus asks, <laughs> or says, and yeah, you know you're in for a good comment there. Either you're lying or you've honestly not even read the book. Every time you mention the term Kalergi plan, you just have to add that doesn't exist. It's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous that you think there's a plan in a book that doesn't contain a plan. <laughs> right? It contains a prediction. Like, if I predict it's going to rain tomorrow, and it rains, all right, that doesn't mean that I made it rain. It means I foresaw that it was going to rain, right? That doesn't, doesn't mean that there's a plan involved. Uh, Scrabby McScrotus also goes on to say, uh, you stupid, who cares if he calls it a plan or not? Fact is, it is exactly happening what is written there. And again, as a German, he's German apparently, they're always whatever is the most appropriate thing to be when making a comment. It is word for word the sickening stuff people translate it to. Destroy the white race through mass migration and race mixing while one noble race has to remain to rule, which have to be the Jews. God, his, his English is bad enough that he might not be English. Uh, word for word, what is your point? Well, that's not in there, word for word and predicting that there would be a lot more migration, predicting that there would be a lot more race mixing doesn't mean that it's a plan or that you're trying to set about to make it happen. It means he had a great deal of foresight. Um, that That's all. Uh, Scrabby goes on to say, Bro, you obviously haven't read his book, Practical Idismus. Obviously, he's... Uh, Sorry, I'm German, and it says 100% exactly what people say. Goof. It it really, really doesn't, Scrabby. It really doesn't. Um, I also reviewed uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition um, this week. This has upset a great deal of, of, of people for some reason. It's hard to predict what games people are going to be upset about when you review them. Um, the ones that people have been most upset about are Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Any Powered by the Apocalypse game that I review, because they all have the same problems. And uh, Burning Wheel has a fanatic fan base as well. I think there's the common thread must be some sort of either insecurity or, or arrogance. 
in the fan base, I think. I, th I think the Pathfinder 2nd Edition people are insecure because it wasn't a success, really, uh, compared to 1st Edition until Wizards of the Coast dropped the ball with the whole OGL scandal um, and then they picked up a bunch of sales, but whether that will turn into players or devoted fans remains to be seen. I don't know that it is going to end up that way. I, w I would be surprised if it if it does, because that whole thing is deflated now and people's righteous fury has gone away. Uh, with Powered by the Apocalypse, I think it's more pretension and arrogance. And, you know, we have made this amazing thing that everyone should love. Why don't you love it? Love me. Please love me. Um, it's kind of like when you when you rebuff someone from an evangelical religion and they get very upset that you are not falling for the same thing uh, that scammed them or people you're know, heavily into crypto. Yeah, that's probably more insulting. Let's go with that. Powered by the apocalypse is the cryptocurrency of role-playing games. And then Burning Wheel, it was a, a darling for a while. The people who play it seem to play it off the back of an obscure reference in a non-core book and seem to be very upset when people take it at face value, uh, which you kind of have to do when you do reviews. But yeah, the Pathfinder thing was uh, was was an interesting uh, backlash to see. Uh, Trithis says, This review basically boils down to this game is a different game and is therefore bad, and several things you say are just flat out wrong. Uh, you start off by saying you can play D&D with a single book, but not Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But you can literally play Pathfinder 2nd Edition without any books. All of the mechanics are officially available for free online. I know you try to skirt past this by saying you're reviewing the book and not a whole bunch of other things, but you titled this and presented it as a review of the system, not the core book itself. Well, I mean, that's what the core book is, is called. Um, and... The player's guide is genuinely all you really need in order to run D&D. But this, despite being a bloated behemoth of a book, um, was not something that I felt you could play straight from the book. There was too much missing. Um, and yet there also simultaneously wasn't enough of a lot of things. It was uh, it, it was all a bit weird. But um, yeah, I mean, that is the problem with the game. It is a different game. That doesn't necessarily make it bad, but I'm not necessarily just reviewing books with my player or games master hat on. I'm also reviewing books from my uh, game designer hat. Uh, I have many hats, as regular viewers will know. Uh, so Pathfinder 1st Edition succeeded because it was continuity 3rd Edition, right? That is why so many people moved over to Pathfinder. And 4th edition was so bad that so many people moved over to Pathfinder. So they could continue to use the wealth of 3rd edition material that existed, and then the wealth of Pathfinder material that existed. So in moving to a different enough game that there isn't really cross-compatibility, you lose that entire point for any of that to exist. Right, So you're not just losing your Pathfinder 1st Edition stuff, you're also losing all the 3rd Edition stuff, the, the legacy content. I understand the, the appeal of creating your, your own game and carving your own path and separating yourself and, and so on, but in this specific case, this feels like a really bad move, and Pathfinder 2nd Edition was not doing very well up until Wizards fucked up again. So that that's the basis uh, of this. You know, who is it for? People bought into this game because they wanted to continue playing 3rd edition. And now all, all of that's gone. You know, Castles and Crusades is basically continuity 2nd edition and continues to do well on that basis. If they wanted to release a new game alongside Pathfinder, or if they wanted to do a, a revised edition, 3.99 or whatever, then that would be fine. But this just seems like it was a bad move, and it was a bad move up until up until recently. Um, what else does Trithis say? Oh, um, about reviewing the book and not a whole bunch of other things. I mean, yeah, you can play all kinds of things because most material is online now. 
you know, so there's SRDs for Pathfinder, there's SRDs for D&D, right? With varying degrees on the wikis of, of gatekeeping and quality control, but yeah, it's all there. But that's not what I'm reviewing. I'm reviewing the book. Uh, did you really call using the word ancestry rather than race pandering? Uh, I can't remember whether I called it pandering or not, but yeah, it is. It is pandering to a certain subset and subsector of the market that is very loud and, and very annoying. Um, but race doesn't mean race in, in this context as we mean it uh, in, in the modern world. You know, this is established from the source materials like Tolkien and you know, many Tolkien derivatives, which is basically the entire fantasy genre. Yeah, it, it's pandering. It's it's pointless, and it doesn't really convey the same thing. It's a, a change without a real reason, and as such, you know, I understand why people do it, but I think that reason is a bad reason. This is an opportunity to educate and inform, and pandering to people doesn't do a very good job. Uh, he then says, I have no clue what you mean when saying you can't copy it onto a character sheet as well. They quite literally give you the space for the extra bits you pointed out. Uh, that was good. Well, icons and so on are relatively hard to transcribe. And the character sheet, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it or not, is one of the most horrendous things about the book as well. So, oof. um, Yeah. Then he references some stuff I, I don't know, saying, I'm not sure why YouTube suggested this video to me. Well, probably because you're a Pathfinder nut. Uh, Knight of the Night Lady says the new Pathfinder uh, just is a cash grab rehash of the Pathfinder 2 book, removing the OGL hooks. Um, yeah, I'll be interested to see how that does. I think that will be a better reflection of how the reactions to Wizards... Um, failed efforts has gone will be how well the revised version of, of Pathfinder 2 sells. I mean um, things like getting rid of the drow was just just dumb <laughs> as well. Uh, more of that pandering I, I suspect actually. More than the um, more than the moving away from wizards. Um, so I did a video recently called Why Activists Are Awful um, including myself in that uh, Midnight Green says, as a father of three, I'll disagree with you about the trans kids issue forever. The trans activists made their fatal mistake with gender affirming care for minors. So uh, what gender affirming care for minors actually is, is psychological assistance and perhaps, you know, living as the opposite gender, as in changing your pronouns, changing the way you dress, changing the way you present. It is not medicine, it is not surgery. Okay, I, I say it is not, but there are certain very extreme circumstances in which there may be some intervention with puberty blockers um, or even with surgery typically on young girls to remove breast buds. But this hardly ever happens. You know, I gave the statistics in the video. It's a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction. And then only a tiny fraction of that tiny, tiny, tiny fraction uh, feel regret and wish they hadn't done it. All right. So it's not something you really need to worry about um, too much. You know, it's all going to be completely reversible up until something surgical or permanently medical is done. Now, I agree we should be more cautious with puberty blockers because there aren't enough long-term um, experiments and investigations in into the effects of those. Uh, but so far, they seem to be safe. And surgery only happens in extremists. It really only happens uh, to teenagers, um, 16 and 17 or older. 16 and 17, there has to be parental permission. 18 plus, obviously, they're considered an adult, so it's it's their decision, you know, regret or not. So this really is not something anyone needs to worry about. Um, yeah, I've done my due diligence here, and I had my reservations. 
So take from that what you will. Uh, back to the Pathfinder review. This is probably the worst take on Pathfinder 2E that I've come across on YouTube, and that's saying something. Well, thank you for your incredibly constructive feedback <laughs> there. That people are allowed not to like things. I was disappointed. It happens. Um, so yeah, back to the activists video where I was talking about trans issues just as a kind of kind of example. Uh, Martin92737, whose account is clearly a throwaway, says, A fat Jew advocating for degenerate behaviour. Colour me surprised. I wonder how he ended up on my channel. Probably via the Kalergi clan, uh, Kalergi clan stuff. Um, I mean, tell me you're an ignorant racist without telling me you're an ignorant racist. Um, I'm not Jewish. Fat questionable. I am old though, so I'm getting a bit chunky, which is why I'm walking every morning. Uh, degenerate? Degenerate is merely the problematic of the far right. <sighs> uh, there's a few other comments, but they don't really amount to much. Uh, let's see. Cthulhu Fatan5771 says about the Pathfinder review video. I love these videos. As for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I bought all the hardcovers as they came out. I've been running a first E uh, campaign for years and hated the books so much I brought them all back for store credit. Uh, they gutted the lore. Monster manuals were minimalist, stat blocks and a few sentences, no details on things. They did find slash replace on terminology that's a standard for decades. Character gen went from deep dives but fewer steps to more steps but shallow as a puddle. Totally incompatible with first edition. Art was largely mid at best. Uh, this was targeted to a vocal few online that want cooperative narrative and who whinge about evil alignments or races. They went in hard. Yeah, this sold well since timing was good, but, and this is anecdotal to my area, after people dug into it, sales dropped sharp and people started buying up first edition. Clearly then I noticed various books have first E compatible pages or first E compatible versions, an unusual step since you're printing two versions of one book. It's also worth noting they flooded the market with supplements. I only bought the hardcover books and I had a full shelf in a year. Yeah, well that, that's kind of their model, which descends from the uh, from the third edition model. Um, yeah, it's I mean, as we've seen with the drow, you know, gutting stuff that upsets a tiny percentage of people seems to be the way they want to go. I prefer the minimalist stat blocks and the whole arrangement of monster attacks and powers is something I find um, easier and more comprehensive than the 5th edition, for example. Um, but yeah, the other material on creatures is, is pretty minimalist in 2nd in edition. You'd think freeing up that space from the stat block would give you more room to give more information on the background and so on um, about creatures, but um, yeah, apparently not. I don't mind the kind of stepped template character creation. Um, I loved it in the Iron Kingdoms RPG, the one that was their own system. Excuse me. Um... But yeah, it is pretty shallow without a bunch of supplementary material. But that's kind of that's kind of how these things go, isn't it? Um, I am very much against the normal model of things because I tend to release a game and then go on and do something else uh, because I'm on onto the next idea, and it's really just me here. So supporting a line isn't really my bag, <laughs> I guess. Um, Johan Dichter uh, commented in that thread and elsewhere. He's clearly one of the uh, Pathfinder fanatics. And he said, uh, third edition is over 20 years old. It's time to move on to different design. The law is the same law that existed before and character creation is far more variable because of things like the free archetype variant rule and the several books containing new classes, ancestries and archetypes. I can understand coming to your conclusion if all you read were the first two rule books, but you couldn't be more wrong about your conclusions. Uh, Pathfinder 2E is incredibly popular, 
and it was necessary after Pathfinder 1 became so weighed down with rules below from the 20 years of playing with the D20 system. Um, someone needs to look up the OSR, <laughs> I think. Uh, being old isn't isn't a problem necessarily. People will find a way to have fun with things. Um, and it was that sheer depth of material, I think, with first edition Pathfinder that really appealed to a lot of people and being able to continue playing the edition that they preferred. Right? And it was it was recognisable. As I said before, Pathfinder 2E severs that connection, loses all that material. And you can't review a book in in the way that you seem to be suggesting. It just it, it can't work like that, right? Because people can't afford to buy everything all in one go for a start. So yeah. Again, I do find the fanaticism of certain groups of game fans weird. Um the only games I can think of that would make me that angry and, and defensive would be ones I've written myself and I think that's justified right uh, my name here is 69 <laughs> nice um, on the Pathfinder review again says uh, I know you said in your 5e games that your players don't take feats but I think that's just your table and nearly all the discourse I've seen and played in 5e campaigns have used feats. So the unique feats in Pathfinder 2 as opposed to the generic droll of 5e were so amazing. 5e will always be cookie cutter because there's only so many ways you can play a character since you don't get many customized options. Um, but there's also such a thing as choice paralysis and uh, overcomplication. Um, my my go-to reference there is always Tristat, which is very simple. You know, you have a character with mind, body, soul stats, and and away you go. Except not, <laughs> because there are skills. But the skills cost a different amount depending what genre of game you're playing. And then there's a near infinite <laughs> number of merits and flaws, powers and drawbacks, and so on. Each one being an exception to the rules, which means what started off simple ends up massively complicated which is um, also what we find in the case of Pathfinder, I think. There are simpler ways of adding depth and options and customization um, that aren't quite so heavy. I mean, a lot of these games where they have too many options end up being like playing complicated Magic the Gathering decks you know, where each card has its own individual rules and then they interact with other cards in certain ways and it all becomes very questionable and you need to be a lawyer to work out what actually happened. So, uh, Cold Napalm 42 again on the Pathfinder review says, okay, saying this is a market flop like 4th edition is being completely disingenuous as it's already a market success even before the OGL windfall. I mean... Okay, but not as much as first edition. Um, and as pointed out earlier, they're dual statting some of their books, recognizing their mistake. Um, but I really meant more in terms of how fourth edition was such a departure, such a change, um, how it rendered everything before it essentially useless. Right? And Tui does that with first edition material, Pathfinder and third edition material D&D stuff. You know, a huge legacy that is suddenly rendered useless in the same way as fourth edition did. And Tui did not do as well. Not even remotely. First edition outsold D&D for a while. And it used to be that you couldn't move in a game shop for the amount of Pathfinder stuff that was in the way of real role-playing games. <laughs> Sorry, I can't resist a dig when people get uppity. Um... Yeah, it's just I was talking more about the philosophy of, of design involved here and uh, the marketing and the nature of the mistake that it was but it was not as successful as first edition uh, Johan is back to try and call me a racist uh, again on the Pathfinder review cheap box ticking exercises Galarian is a diverse place especially the inner sea region I am not seeing it as being a trap unless you only want to see straight white people in your fantasy game. 
No. Um, I'm talking more in the echo chamberlain sense of you don't have a diverse culture, you don't have a diverse world if every culture is diverse. <laughs> right? You don't get the flavour, you don't get the suspension of disbelief, you don't get the immersion because it simply doesn't make sense. So, you know, not every fantasy world, not every fantasy nation should have the makeup of downtown Los Angeles in terms of um, colour and racial diversity. Right? That's not... That's not racist. That's not only wanting to see straight white people. It's just... This doesn't have verisimilitude. And you might think that, think that sounds silly in a fantasy world, but... Yeah, I've covered that in plenty of videos before. The more weird and magical things you have in your world, the more the important mundane things have to make sense. Uh, the more importance is placed upon that. It's seemingly a paradox, but it really isn't. It's just good world design. That's all I have time for. I was going to limit myself to half an hour on these. Maybe I'll do another one next week. Uh, we shall see. So check out post-mort.com, buy my shit, like, subscribe, spread this video or any other video you prefer uh, anywhere you can on social media because I have bugger all reach on social media these days due to various shadow bannings and whatever else is going on. So it would be helpful if you, uh, if you help me out. Take care. Uh, see you over the weekend for the Week in Geek over on T-Shirted Historian's channel and I will be running a one-shot of Space 1889, the Ubiquity version, on Sunday at 8pm UK. So, drop by and watch. See ya. Zang. Rob Necronomicon's art has graced several Postmortem Studios products, and Rob has also produced some stock art pieces you can use in your own projects or at your gaming table. Rob's stark, dark graphical style is perfect for horror, old school fantasy, and dark future projects. You can buy Rob's art from Postmortem Studios at DriveThruRPG or at post-mort.com. <laughs>